Hey everyone, you know what it is, it's Conquest Tearless Review. I'm Mecha, and I'm really, really bad at making Fire Emblem Fates pairings. But fortunately, the next couple episodes, I'm going to learn all about it, all with you, with the expert of Fates Eugenics. <laughs> this is Soren. How are you doing today? I've spent way too much time thinking about this <laughs> in my life. <laughs> so, a lot of these kids I have recruited, I think, once. Some of them I've never used, some of them I've used multiple times. But generally, my pairings have been either informed by other people or they've been made completely blindly and then I post a screenshot and someone makes fun of me for it. That's usually the way that it goes. And I am super looking forward to figuring out all the optimal, best, uh, funniest pairings you can possibly make to make these kids as good as possible. But we have to get some ground rules out of the way to uh, kind of, I guess, ground the discussion in some form where we can actually talk about these units because they're so variable and they're so different from just the static Gen 1 units that you have to make a couple of assumptions beforehand. And also, we just have to talk about, you know, what goes into making a good Fates pairing because there's it's so unintuitive if you've never done it before. There's some things you can kind of gather from the discussion that we've had so far, I think. Uh, but generally, the game that I've made the most pairings in is Genealogy of the Holy War, which is probably the opposite of fates in terms of what you want to do. In genealogy, parents pass down their inventory and their growth to their kids. And usually, along with skills, that's where the emphasis is. And so a kid often wants a pairing that's as much like them as possible. So if you're a mage kid, you want a mage dad. If you're a, I don't know, generally you want Pursuit in FE4. Uh, but generally, if you're like a, a Swordmaster, you kind of want the Swordmaster parent. These are generalizations. But in Fates, it feels almost the opposite because you kind of want to get skills from inheritance that you aren't able to get easily as a kid. And that alone always throws me for a loop and makes me not able to grasp what a good pairing would possibly be. And in addition, you also need parents that can actually work well together because if they don't want to be together in a tech stance or a pair up, then it's going to be really annoying to make pairings together. Also, availability kind of has to match. So there is just so much that goes into it um, that I never really have been able to fully grasp, although I'm getting a little bit better at it. So which of these factors do you usually weigh heavily when you're making pairings? Well, I think you're, you're right that there is a certain tension between the idea of getting a diverse set of skills to pass down that the kids couldn't get by themselves naturally, which is a pretty cool bonus that the kids can get, you know, coming in, potentially starting in a great class and getting other good skills from other class trees that they don't have right away. Or sometimes it's the other way around where they start in a class, it gives them good skills and they just need a parent to give them some other kind of class outside of their starting class set. So it's not always obvious that you, for example, should match up your Cavaliers to make a good Cavalier kid or something like that. Like, I don't think Silas and Perry together make a particularly great Sophie, even though they all match. That That's maybe the uh, the most complicated part of this, is you you want to balance the, the goal of getting good stats on the children and having parents who are compatible with each other and work well together in battle with the second goal of making, like, good skill sets for the kids, which is sometimes at odds with the first one. Do you, when you're looking for good stats on children, how do you go about that? Because do you just, you pass down growths and stats to some extent, I assume? Uh, but how yeah. much does it factor um, in there? Like, does it make a big difference? Stat inheritance isn't a huge deal in this game. Um, passing down stats is a way bigger um, factor in for the children in Awakening than it is in Fates. Um, in fact, the, the amount of stats you your parents can pass down to the kids as, as bonus stats beyond what they would grow no normally. It's pretty limited. It's There might be a possible case where you could theoretically pass down plus four, but in practice, it's usually just one or two points at best in a handful of stats. And on ra very rare occasions, you pass down plus three in something. This is talking about bases, right? Not growths. Yeah. Uh, Growths-wise, I guess technically the variable parents do have a bigger effect in Fates than they do in Awakening, because the the variable parent is half of the child's growths in Fates, where it was one-third in Awakening. Um, but the range of growths is generally smaller in Fates, so if you're... I know you yourself, Becca, are not that experienced in 
with Awakening kids either. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I learned everything from the last year's review <laughs> with Cat about yeah. Awakening, and that, I forgot half of that too. Uh, but I I do feel like Awakening kids feel a lot di different depending on which parent you choose for them than the Fates kids do. So I, I, like I think it's more interesting in Fates because of the way the class system works and. Uh, and how you gain class trees through friendship and partnership and everything. Um, but I think the, the effect of the parents is feels less dramatic in this game. Like we're going to talk about some of the, for some of the best parents for each kid. And I, I think if you're trying to rate them fairly in a tier list format, you really do have to, we'll talk about this in a minute, but I really think you do have to, can see that each kid is going to have one of their maybe top three or four parents because the whole idea is you're like you're trying to make them good right yeah. if you're if you're getting the kids at all you're probably trying to like put some effort into it um and in that context i think it really only makes sense to consider how how good the kids can be if you're trying to make them good um but the rain the the difference between the best parent and the worst parent for most kids is not that dramatic. Like, it'll make a pretty clear difference in the context of a tier list where you're trying to compare them against other units because there'll be some parents who make a uh, a kid at least pretty good and some parents who make them kind of bad relative to the rest of the cast. But they're all workable. You don't have to worry about this. And uh, the usual disclaimers apply. We're like, if you just want to play the game and pair up the people who you think look cute together and you're curious about how to make that work that that's not the topic of this discussion but that's something that's totally valid and it can work just fine yeah it might be more relevant for the kids than for the other units in this tier list because it's it's such a it's a customizable part of your playthrough so you, you really have to enjoy what you're doing to yeah. like, get the most out of these kids and this is by definition something you're not going to do if you're playing optimally and i guess we can kind of segue into uh, rules and assumptions for a little bit um, mm -hmm. like turn counts have been factored in mildly for this, like turn counts, efficiency, whatever you want to call it. We agreed that it makes no sense to tier kids as if we're trying to get the absolute lowest turn count possible or really care about turn count because every kid you'd have to play their paralog and so it kind of costs turns. And instead, the assumption is more like, well, you're going to play a couple paralogs in this playthrough, and what do you get out of this kid if you play their paralog and try to make them good? That's kind of the basic question we're trying to answer. Where does the kid end up if you were to play their paralog and everything else is still... Every other assumption we've made about efficiency is still roughly the same. So they're not being penalized for their paralog being like 20 turns long, for example. It doesn't matter. Is that That's kind of how I feel about it. Is it a match with yours? Yeah, the way I, I would imagine this is like... We're not that worried about the, the turns lost on recruiting the kid. Uh, there are some who you can get in one turn, you can finish their their maps in the first turn. But um, I, I don't think we really care about that at all. Um, like, I, I wouldn't expect to be sitting around for 14 or 15 or 20 turns on a map like Shigure's or, or Sophie, so you can get the maximum number of reinforcements and totally capitalize on all the experience you can get from those paralogs. Like I I think basically we're imagining that you you play the maps and you you beat the objective and you recruit the kid and then from that point on you're trying to see uh, what can they do for me in the rest of the run. I'm gonna play at a fast-ish pace. I, I might do a few more paralogs after this, but I'm not doing full recruitment, so I'm not carefully mapping out all my support ranks so I can get everyone married and do all the paralogs and really blow out the level curve at some point in the game. Um, it's more like, I, I would guess like a normal playthrough where you're not trying super hard to get all the kids might, you might recruit somewhere between three and six or seven of them. Yeah. Um, just kind of depending on what pairings you went with. Like, uh, like if you never get a Zura paired up, that's going to cost you Shigure, which could be you know, otherwise a pretty easy part of the, the mix here. Um, you may never get corn married, which would be weird, but yeah. possible. I feel like that's the um, one that most people will just get without even particularly trying to get paralogs. It's, I think almost everyone gets kind of paralog. At yeah, I mean, I could I, I could see it happening. Like obviously in the LTC, you don't bother, as we said. Um, but I guess you could just like stick corn and Gunter together for the whole game and never 
get married. That could happen. Oh, yeah. I guess if they're the same gender, if it's male corn, then you could yeah. get a vegetarian marriage, I guess. Yeah, that's possible. It's, uh... Uh, but yeah, so we're, we're not trying to, for example, we're not trying to stack seven pair logs in a row right after chapter 20 so that everyone can get a whole bunch of level 15 skills for the rest of the game. Um, we're not trying to really game the system so that we can get any particular child super early. I think the most notable person this is a problem for is Siegbert um, because his father doesn't join until chapter 16. So it's pretty difficult to recruit him early, particularly before the uh, the enemies start promoting. It's possible, but he only has, if you're just counting story maps, all he gets is chapter 16, chapter 17, and then that's it. Chapter eight After chapter 18, um, all the enemies start promoting. So if you wanted to get his paralog done before it got particularly hard, um, you would have to train a whole bunch of paralogs or invasions together before chapter 18, and I'm not really expecting to do that. Yeah. Paralog timing is probably something important to mention, especially in the context of Siegbert. Uh, I, I I, think last time after recording, you said that there's roughly four, maybe more like three, but possibly four main benchmarks where you can do paralogs. You could do them ASAP, so you get the most out of the kit's availability, and they'll be around for the longest. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the advantage being that you can get the resources from the paralog super early, which might be really good for someone like Ophelia, because getting the tomes from her paralog early will help you, for example, chapter 17, get Calamity Gate on the ninjas there. Uh, or you can wait until the kids start promoting along with the enemies so that they get the offspring seal and promotes to a promoted level. You could wait until, I think it was like level five. I'm not sure what chapter it is, but they'll get the level five skill if you wait a little bit longer. Uh, yeah, and that, that coincides with uh, the third shop as well. So if you do it after chapter 20, they'll promote to level six and you'll be able to buy unlimited seals uh, from the level three staff store. So you can start doing class changes to your heart's content immediately. Yeah, as long as you have the gold for it. And is there like a benchmark for chapter for like level 15 or is that just like beyond the game's ending? Uh, I believe you recruit kids at level... They, well, with the offspring seals, they get to level 16 after chapter 25, I think, and level 18 after chapter 26. Uh, and that's not really a practical thing to do if you're just if you're trying to use the kids because they have basically no chapters left to participate, and they also don't get a lot of time to go pick up extra skills. So if they're not inheriting every skill they want, it's going to get awkward. Um, that's basically just for a couple of special cases, like if you're trying to get one of the two kids who starts with a staff rank to have B staves, you can recruit them really late. Uh, and get the, the free weapon experience from that. Um, and then there's a handful of other edge cases. Like, you can get a super late Midori who's able to one-round Takumi. <laughs> uh, because Midori has um, spendthrift out of Merchant and can get something like life and death from her father and potentially, like, trample from Camilla all all at once. Um, so that that's a thing you could do. That's funny. I uh, okay, but it, it's generally not going to be a practical option. Speaking of not really. Uh, speaking of low cost utility, I guess there's that disclaimer that you can make all the kids be low effort, low hanging fruit utility bots with skills that don't really require stats to be functional, like having a rally skill, having shelter, being able to use the rescue staff. You know, these are good things to have for your playthrough but not really interesting to discuss. So we're just going to mention it here. That's pretty much it. Like all these kids can do that kind of stuff. I guess the, the ones that have mounts can do it slightly better than others. Generally not very mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, if a kid has like standout utility in some sort of way, like it really sets them apart. Uh, I think this goes mostly for, I think you said Shigure and Siegbert rain ones or like the staff ones. Then yeah, I guess we'll mention that. But for the most part, this is about using the kids as combat units, right? Like main front and center combat, combat bots. Generally, yeah. I, I would say for that kind of generic utility role that's on this tier list that would probably slide in somewhere between Laszlo and Shura. Um, like just depending on the specific characteristics. characteristics. Like you mentioned, if they start mm -hmm. with a mount that makes them slightly better at being a rally bot because they can move farther. Um, and that's nice, I guess. Um, a couple people start with some of the more useful uh, support skills 
like Sophie comes with shelter, Percy can promote or Shigure can promote and get a rally instantly, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so those make them slightly better at those jobs than just the rest of the kids, but pretty much all of them can do something like that. Like the, whether it's shelter or even like lock touch, plus one rally, which basically any set of parents can give them. It's they'll become decent. There'd be a reasonable argument for taking them in your deployment slots for the rest of the game. They would do something for you. They just wouldn't be very special or interesting. And it's not there's not much to talk about there. So mm -hmm. that's just yeah. summing that up. Yeah, that that is one of the main ways I've used some of the kids. So that's got to be where part of my, part of my lack of experience with the actual kids as combat units is going to come from is doing that instead of taking the easy route out, which is it's a good route to take if you don't particularly invest in a kid. But uh, we're gonna get into the more interesting things about these kids. I I'm kind of out of rules and assumptions to go through. Was there anything that we missed up to this point? I hope not. I hope not. Well, it'll come up at some point if yeah. if we did miss something important, I guess. So. Shall we just get into Kana? Sure. All right. Uh, I was talking on stream a while back when I was playing the Soyo, and I think Septi was in chat, and she said, yeah, Kana's one of the worst units in the game. And I just kind of laughed. I was like, how can a kid be the worst or among the worst units in the game? Because she's she's a kid of one of the S tiers. She's a kid of Korin, who is one of the best units in this game and the best unit in other games where Kana also exists. So how can someone this good make someone that's this bad? And... But every time I've played, I've never really been able to get much out of Kana. Part of it is probably because the Nor Noble, or I guess the other routes, the Nor or the Hoshiden version of that, it's just not very good. Uh, I mean, Dragonstone was good in the early game, but it doesn't really hold up well in the late game. The fastest poor bases. And I guess from there, where do you get is like the reclass options. Corrin probably gives you one of the better reclasses just because they can just pick their class. So you think you could put Kana into a useful class from there? Part of it might just be that I also just have Kana's Paralog. I usually plan it with like what other units want in mind instead of what I want out of Kana because it's such a useful EXP grinding map for anyone who's trying to pick up skills late game uh, because the Paralog enemies level up along with the story progression. So if and I want to Kana get... can't use it either, which is one of those funny like Lazlo situations. Oh, you're too. right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's, it's so stupid that Kana's an NPC that can't get experience in this chapter. Like he's a, he or she is on there. But all they do is like steal your kills and not much else, yeah. and they just join after with. And <laughs> there was one funny bit too. I don't remember if it was Kana or someone else, but if if you have a if a parent pick up a skill mid mission, they can have, end up passing it down without you wanting to. That's how I almost end up with um, strength plus two forest at some point, yeah. which is very stupid. Which is, it's actually fantastic for Kana if you're aware of that and you you're going to take advantage of it because it means you can go into that paralog without having quite reached one of the the top end skills and use the experience factory that is her paralog to get there uh but if you're not aware of it yeah that can catch you off guard and cause problems for sure yeah so yeah i've never really been able to make use of kana every time i tried it kind of ended up poorly there was this one playthrough that i've mentioned before where i did uh the replicate jacob strat where the idea is that you have like a bunch of free deployment replicates and i was able to replicate kana but like i said all i was able to do with her that was really of any value was having two units instead of one that could activate dragon veins for me that was it that was my whole replicate utility the unit itself absolute uh garbage for me and it does not shock me <laughs> it's not shock me it, it i was see... jacob kana right yes yeah yeah it was um yeah corn got ninja talent and then jacob married her and then uh, Jacob reclassed to mechanists and then got replicates somewhat yeah. early. It was You're it saddling was... poor Kana with Jacob's growths too. <laughs> yeah, poor poor Kana. Uh, I did see your video where you have uh, Kana with the Dragonstone plus one shot a bunch of uh, I think it was Faceless and Stoneborn in the yeah, Yago yeah. Hans chapter. That was pretty cool. But I did, I do yeah, also remember you said it took like fifty spirit dusts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's that's so funny because it's like that's Oph at least Ophelia Kana. So it's like not quite the most magically powerful Kana you can get, but close to it. And even then, it was like, I think it was three spirit does, if I remember correctly, but it was like the majority of them for the whole run to make that happen. Like it's... it's and that's a kid's kid. That's the only third gen kit you can get, right? Yeah. That's um, insane. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I'm out of anecdotes. Kana sucks for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, uh, Kana, I think... She's no Morgan, that's for sure. Or he. Um, 
kind of highlights a lot of the problems that I I sort of briefly touched on way back when we were talking about Corin, about how uh, the starting class Nor Prince or Nor Princess is really a big nothing of a class. I think it, it works well in the early game in Fates with the Dragonstone and everything, and I enjoy using it then, and I think it's very effective. But the class, it's okay, it's got swords, which are probably the worst weapon type in the game. Um, Kana is like modestly more magic leaning than Corrin is, so you might look at that and say, well, okay, they can use Eleven Sword. And that's sort of true. At least they, Eleven Sword is likely to exist around the time when you have uh, Kana joining the team. Um, but the Dragonstone, as you said, like really falls off later in the game, and the class has no skills worth speaking of. Uh, nobility is the starting skill, plus 20% experience. With the way the uh, the experience scaling works in this game, that's really bad, uh, because once you get more than a couple uh, levels ahead of the enemies, it basically stops having an effect, and if you track the actual increase in experience that nobility is giving you, it turns out to be maybe worth 50 to 60 experience lead. So bad. And that's about it. So it's not even a full level, usually. Uh, because if you get less experience, you'll catch up fairly quick because you'll get more experience from killing the enemies. And nobility mostly just makes it so like the enemies are act as if they're one level higher than they are, which is not that much of a difference. So... Uh, as you catch up, I guess, if you're on the levels. But not even that, not nearly as much as you might hope. Yeah. Like, if you're way behind in levels, then it it can be a pretty significant factor. But you only stay way behind for one map, basically, at most. Or if you're if you're continuing to stay way behind in levels, then why are you using the unit, or are you using the unit? Maybe the more relevant question. So yeah, nobility basically does nothing. Uh, Dragon Fang has very marginal uses for boss killing, but otherwise it's mostly not helpful at best, sometimes harmful. Same problem as a lot of the other random proc uh, offensive skills. It, it's not hard to hit the kill thresholds in this game with just the raw stats and damage boosting skills and stuff, so you're much better off relying on that than you are hoping for a 18% chance to deal. 50 damage in one hit. Like, Dragon Fang looks cool and it does a lot of damage, but it's pretty impractical. Uh, and then beyond that, you get Draconic Hex and Norian Trust, which are cool for gimmicks, but are not very relevant for the kind of style of play we're gearing towards. Yeah, I sometimes I get accidental use out of Draconic Hex, but usually if you're not one running, it's not really worth the combat. Not really worth doing combat with that unit in the first place. And then I don't even remember what Norin Trust does. Yeah. Uh, it get, it steals proc skills from your partner. So <laughs> if the supporting unit has Soul mm -hmm. or Luna or Astra or, or Dragon Fang themselves or something, um, then you can activate it if, you, if you're the lead unit and you have Norian Trust. Okay, that's... That's probably really funny for some gimmicky builds, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, but very much gimmicks. So, yeah, so the problem with Kana is, for one, their starting class is mostly useless. Uh, they can get a good secondary class because they, they get to have the talent class from from Corrin. Yeah, children, uh, children just inherit all their parents' classes, right? It's not all of them. Oh shit. It's generally so the way this works is each kid has one predefined class which is their starting class and then they they get one more class from their father which is usually the father's primary class but if there's overlap then it could be the father's secondary class instead and then after that they inherit one more class from their mother which again is usually the mother's primary class but if there's overlap with either of the first two, it could be the mother's secondary class, or in a couple rare cases where there's overlap with both of the mother's classes, then you could get a parallel class as well. Oh yeah, I've seen that before. So Kana is practically guaranteed to get Korn's talent in, right? 
Anna will in fact always get Corin's yeah. talent. Uh, one way or another. Yeah, so some part of me says, alright, so you can get like Ninja, Dragonite, whatever you want from that instead, and then problem solved, right? Yeah, which would be great if Kana had good stats, but Kana is Corin, but notably worse. <laughs> uh, their bases are not as good for the level, and their growths are worse too. And they don't benefit from any of the, the unique servant skills, so they don't get to use personal skills from Jacob or Felicia or Gunter to help carry them. And their support pool is way more limited because uh, it's basically just their parents and then the other kids. Kana does support a lot of the other children, but uh, not all of them even because they only get a couple of same-sex friends. And it's just like the whole, the whole picture is just dramatically worse for, for Kana than for Corin. Um, so, like, stats are really on the low end, just about across the board. Uh, classes are not great because the starting class, like, not only is it not a good class to stay in, it's not a good class to start in because it doesn't give you good skills that you can bring elsewhere. So you're really, really reliant on getting a heart seal and going into, ideally, a good talent class or um, a class inherited from the other parent. And if you're trying to take advantage of some of the unique things that Kana can do, those are really at odds with making Kana actually good at combat. So you brought up the, the replicate strategy, and I've gone on record before saying I'm not a fan of that in general, but it's it's really bad for Kana, because it Kana already has bad stats. Jacob's stats are even worse. Um, and you're, you're passing down replicate to a bad unit. So you have two bad units after spending a turn replicating them. It's like, okay, what are we doing here? <laughs> it was What's so bad. This? Combat was so sad. Um, <laughs> it was very bad. <laughs> you could dual strike with your replica to have one and a half bat unit in combat sometimes. So that's, that's true. You can do that. Um, it's awful. It bears mentioning also that Kana doesn't have a very good personal skill. Uh, it's way worse than supportive. Uh, Draconic Air makes them recover 20% HP every turn, I believe. If they're if they're currently holding, as in have equipped a Dragonstone, uh, so you can only do that in Nor Prince or Princess or Nor Noble, which again not a very good class, and you're locked to probably the the worst weapon type to be using in those classes. You'd much rather, in general, be using the Leaven Sword or a Tome, and not the Dragonstone, even though the Dragonstone Plus is cool and fun and my friend. Uh, so it, it's, it basically does nothing. Um, Kana has pretty bad stats. The, the class access is all right. A lot of times, actually, it's better than what Kana's sibling might have because Kana's sibling is going to be saddled with Nor Prince or Princess as their, one of their alternate classes. They don't get the talent class ever, which is very sad. Um, so at least you can use the, whatever Korn's talent is and generally that's going to be something decent. Uh, but they're still going to be subpar in that class. Like, if you pick Wyvern, they're going to be maybe your fifth best option as a Wyvern Rider, and will cost you a Heart Seal. Uh, Ninja, they're going to be, again, probably like the fifth best one you could get. Maybe. Probably worse than that, honestly. And just, nothing really comes together to make a compelling unit here. Sucks. And this is usually this is going to be the introduction unit to kids for a lot of people because yeah. Corin is the easiest person to pair. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, the fall from Morgan is very far indeed. Yeah, maybe they maybe they regretted how strong they made Morgan, and so they went with this instead. Which I, I get, maybe. but damn, there's, there's still some good kids in this game, and this is not one of them. Do you think yeah. there is a meaningful distinction between the two genders of Kana? Um, not really. I I guess I think the female Khan is a little bit better, uh, largely because she can have Camilla as a mother, who goes a long way towards salvaging anyone as a kid, but, you know, giving Khan a trample early-ish is a possibility, um, and that's pretty nice. Um, and Camilla also passes down really great growths and obviously gives 
a good class, so you don't have to pick dragon talent. Um, you can go with something else. Um, I, I also do think if you're like looking for interesting things to do with Kana, then Elisophilia is a pretty cool option that you don't get with um, with female corn. Um, but Kana's best moms are basically just Camilla. End of list. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's not much. There really aren't many other women who can help, or I guess in Kana's case, also best dads to consider. Yeah, I was about to bring. This um, is the this is the child yeah. that can have the most possible pairing parents. Yeah, just... and and the sad truth is like, none of them but Camilla are very good. <laughs> uh. Because just because Con Kana needs so much help with stats, and it's hard to actually get that from parentage because the effect of the variable parent is more limited in this game. Um, so you're like, it's, it's basically the best mom in the game, best parent in the game, or bust. Um, Jacob and Felicia have interesting gimmicks they can do because of their early skill um, acquisition, but they they make Kana's problems with stats even worse. So it's, I think it's hard to recommend that. So I guess the question is, are these actually the worst units that we've tiered so far? Are they worse than, say, Nyx and Benny? Assume you're going to count as Paralog and we're not counting down against them. Because yeah. they sound pretty bad to me. You know, there's some free stuff you can do with Nyx. I don't know about Benny, but... Yeah, I've, I've gone back and forth on, on this myself a little bit. Like, whether... Like, there... Kana does have the best caps in the game, especially if you marry a third gen unit. So if you really want to do something spectacular, you might want to look at, you know, doing that with Kana. Uh, it's just really hard to actually make that happen, and certainly not something that actually helps your run in any way. Um, but I'm a fan of fun gimmicks like that. So part of me says, oh yeah, they're better than like. Benny and Perry, maybe. But on the other hand, is that objectively true? Yeah, maybe not. So I, I could respect making Kana the worst in, on the list. I could I could put her above Perry and him. Yeah. Um, kind another, of wherever. Another way of looking at it might be like, okay, so Kana, even if we try her be our best to make it work within the constraints that we've said, she's just not a good combat unit. But we still have that minimum bar of like passing down utility skills to make her somewhat serviceable. Do, do, mm -hmm. Maybe those could be argued to make her better. Like that option makes her better than like say Benny and Nix, who don't really have anything like that. Yeah, I, I think that's really the strongest reason to consider her, consider both versions of Kana better than bottom of the barrel. Um, it's basically just a combination of yeah, they can do the generic kid utility stuff and. If you really try, there are some cool things you can do with really high magic or strength. Uh, but that's not terribly practical. No. All right, I'll uh, slide him above Benny for now, I guess. Uh, OK. Come here. There we go. And you. Come here. Oh, that's 2-1. We're going to totally get this all done in one episode at this rate. We just did two at the same time. So easy. Yeah, easy. <laughs> For real though, I know that I think at least if we just talked about the kids alone, it would take multiple episodes and we just had that whole meta discussion. So I'm not expecting this to be finished within one episode, maybe two, we'll see. But uh, as you probably already realized, we're not doing all these in one episode. Yeah. All right. Uh, are we done with Kana, by the way? I think so. All right. Uh, Shigure, I have recruited a couple of times, mostly as a utility unit. The, the thing with Shigure is that's like, the best thing about him is that it's so easy to make him a good utility bot that it's kind of hard for me to imagine him doing anything else. Uh, I like to refer to him as Rally HB. Like most, ra you can't Rally HB, but you can use Rally with his personal skill to, I think it's heal 10% to injured units. That's mm -hmm. fine, I guess. And then he has a really easy access to Rally Speed. If you recruit him uh, at the point where he promotes to level six, he just, you can make him a Falcon Knight, get Rally Speed, and that's good. You can probably pass him another Rally if you want to. Um, I think Shelter is fairly accessible to him. I forgot why, but I had Shelter on him when I recruited him, and that was pretty nice. Uh, but I'm not sure what his combat prospects are like if you wanted to. I know Azura has 
insane growths to just to like fool you with the things it's good, I guess. Which don't don't <laughs> well, affect his growths, but they can have an impact on his inheritance. Oh, I see. Fair enough. Well, I mean, just another part that shows I don't really know a whole lot about Shigure. So, is there more to him besides uh, rally utility? Uh, a little bit. I do really like him for his rally utility, and I think he's one of the, the few kids who is a real standout in that regard. Um, it's not just a situation where you're passing down like rally defense from or rally strength from one of the million parents who get access to that and then just calling them a mounted rally bot and having and, and calling it a day. Um, because like you said, uh, Shigure has his own personal rally and then also has quick access to rally speed, which is relatively difficult to access in conquest yeah. you can capture a sky knight fairly early and train them up uh that's not the easiest process in the world though because they're basically a, a, a lance lock unit with like generic sky knights or or captured i guess you can't even capture a falcon knight until significantly later but you can capture a kenshi knight in chapter 14 and then reclass them i wouldn't do that but you can i guess they're really um, easy to capture because they're weak to bows yeah, um, their stats are not great for most combat in Conquest and uh, being lance locked effectively while you're on your way to rally speed is not the greatest um, for a unit with unimpressive physical stats like a generic Sky Knight will have. And you don't get, like some of them have decent magic stats, but you don't get a Bolt Naginata. So there's no really great one, two range magic option for them either. So anyway, um, Shigure is the most convenient source of rally speed, I think. Um, and that's a pretty useful thing to have. And then you also have his uh, perfect pitch skill, which like you, you described is basically rally HP. I think a lot of people really underrate it because they see, oh, it's a 10% HP and it only heals up their wounds. It doesn't boost their max HP. And that feels kind of bad. It's like it's, it's a small number, maybe three or four if you're lucky, five points at a time. Um, but the way I look at it is, like, you're going to be rallying anyway, probably. And here's this secondary benefit you get where you can get partial healing on a whole bunch of units at once for no extra actions. And that can add up fairly quickly. Uh, depending on how you play, it may not have that big of an impact. Like, if you're just sending one Juggernaut in to go kill all the enemies, then the extra HP you're getting back from this is not going to make that much of a difference because either that unit is doing lifesteal strats with Solar Nasiratu or you're just healing them up with other staves every turn when they need it. So it doesn't really matter. But if you're playing with a... let's say a, a broader army with where the training is... Like the, the experience is going around to uh, a lot more units and more more of the army is getting involved in combat and everyone's going to take chip damage fairly frequently and Shigure can give you pretty good value for one action with uh, rally speed, probably some other rally. He does have native access to rally res resistance um, if you go through Strategist, uh, so that's convenient. Um, and then you get the, the Rally HP effect too, and that's that's pretty nice. Uh, I do like using Jacob as his father because that's the only way he gets access to uh, Wyvern Rider, which is an incredible class for him uh, for a couple reasons. It actually makes him pretty good at combat, um, even despite the fact that Jacob's growths are not that good. Um, they, they do drag him down a bit, but he comes with Darting Blow. He gets Wyvern access. His, his mom tends to pass him. If you've been singing a lot throughout the game, his mom tends to pass him uh, at least a, a modest amount of extra strength and, and speed, which is cool. And skill. Um, depending when you recruit him, she might even pass down something like Voice of Peace to make him extra bulky. And he becomes a reasonably fast Wyvern Rider who also happens to be carrying around three rallies for basically the cost of one heart seal. And yeah, that's pretty useful. Uh, I I don't think he ever really becomes a great combat unit. Uh, there are a few other physical fathers who are decent for him. Um, the only problem for him 
in terms of getting other parents is uh, the process of getting Azura paired off is it's not free. Yeah, I think it's, it's fairly easy if you're. I think it's fairly easy to do if you're playing at a something even slightly more relaxed than LTC pace, and her partner joins fairly early. Um, so, like, if you if you've got Jacob one, or you pair Azura with Silas, or uh, you worst case even someone like Laszlo, uh, like you you can get it done in a reasonable time frame. It's not that hard to do, but you do have to try. Like you you have to consider that okay, I want Azura to be, you know, singing to where wherever it's needed. But if I have a choice between, let's say, I want to get her married with Laszlo. Then I, if I ever have a turn where I have a choice between singing for Laszlo and singing for someone else who might also, you know, do something productive, I'm gonna want to choose Laszlo so I get those extra support points along the way. I remember, you have to think about that and make that happen. I remember when playing, the one way to do it really easily but very slowly would be to shelter dance or just dance the same person over and over when the map is nearly over and you're just waiting to seize. And that I think it takes yep, about you can do that. Yeah, that takes. I was I was just in, gonna say. It, <laughs> In, in real terms, it's not that hard to do. No. Like if, if if you're not morally opposed to that kind of thing, mm -hmm. it takes a couple minutes and it's very simple. Yeah. And it gives is there extra experience. So there's like objectively not much of a reason not to do it, except if you really care about turn count. Yeah, or just feel dirty doing it for some reason. I was gonna say yeah. that's like that's like an easy method to do it. I remember someone telling me in chat when I was trying to pair Jacob with with Jacob two, I think, with uh Azura. Um it was like it was getting very annoying to have to dance every time so I was like just just have Azura dual strike with someone every once in a while if you can do it it gives way more support points yep. per turn it's just you have to leave, have someone as dual strike with Azura which is not great but you know it's, it's going to get it over faster <laughs> yep there are places where you can make that work it's just another thing where depending on the partner I guess some of them can do it better than others um, but it's another thing where you're going to have to try um, Azura does have really good dual strikes because Whatever else she has, she has very good strength. Uh, but it's just difficult to put her in a position where you can use those very well. Yeah, isn't her base really bad, though? I don't remember her doing particularly like a lot of damage. Um, It's kind of bad. I mean, the the central problem is she's like level one. Um, But her strength goes at like 65 or 70% or something stupid. Um, and... Yeah, it's five base. It, yeah, if, if again, if you're if you're singing every turn like you should be, um, that's one of the things that kills me every time I watch people play conquest on streams and stuff, and they just have Azura like wait, like, why? <laughs> but if you're singing every turn like you should be, and you're not going the app for the absolute minimum turn count, like Azura's gonna level up reasonably quickly, and she has decent opportunities to build up support points if you're focus on doing that uh, but anyway for Shigure uh, I don't think he gets much better than Jacob Shigure as a combat unit um, you could make because he doesn't have it he has more like way more bulk than his mom for sure he's um, but he's not like a huge standout statistically so you could have Azura marry someone like Kaze and make him a ninja and that can work um, Voice of Peace actually makes a surprisingly large difference in that regard. Uh, but I, I think that's less impressive than what he can do with, with Jacob in particular. Um, and then there are other choices, like um, Corrin marriage is bad, probably, because he gets Nor Prince and doesn't love that. It doesn't give him anything. Um, but it, it can give him decent stats. There's not much demand for just a, a pure Falcon Knight or... Well, I mean, Kenshi Knight's a great class. I strongly prefer Archer Kenshi Knight to, to Sky Knight Kenshi Knight. Um, but... Or quick draw and stuff, I assume. Yeah. Uh, but if he's not getting another great class from his father, being duck in either Sky Knight or Troubadour is pretty limiting. But he's great at utility no matter who his parents are and if you give him Jacob in particular then he gets both I wouldn't say excellent combat but very good combat 
uh, if you decide to focus on that. But I think more importantly, even better rally utility. Yeah, so a really good minimum with on top of that with a little bit more potential in combat if you wanted to, if you have a mm -hmm. Jacob free form. Yep. It's, uh, it sounds like at so, least a B tier to me. Yeah, I mean, I, looking at my notes, and I I have him higher than Gunter, actually. And I think that's fair. Yeah, I can um, see that. I mean, Gunter and Arthur are basically just utility bots mm -hmm. for the way we've been discussing them. Honestly, all these units, besides, like... Some early game combat utilities from FE. This is basically all. Uh, I guess Mozu is more the growth unit than a utility pod, but. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair. But uh, yeah, I, it's kind of hard for me to justify putting any kid in A tier, Ye honestly. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't put him that high mm -hmm. myself either. Yeah, I think uh, Kaze is just a step better than that. But yeah, he, he's like really good, and the, the uniqueness of threat speed, especially, is so good because. We haven't really mentioned Rally Speed a whole lot. I think the best option was like reclass Selena out of the units we've had here. That's about yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, also marrying Laszlo to Selena or having, uh, I guess, any of the men can marry Azura and go for it. Oh, yeah. I would not recommend making Azura a Falcon Knight, though. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not convenient. You can get it, like we said, you can capture a Sky Knight very early. Um, promote them fairly quickly and, and train up to get it, but it's not, it's something you have to work towards. And I, I don't think it's that important for hitting the mid game speed thresholds. Like we've discussed, you can, even in chapter 17, where you want to get like 29 speed, and a lot of your units have maybe 18 to 20, you can get there with other sources without rally speed, without too much hassle. So I think rally speed makes its biggest impact after the chapter 20-ish time frame. And that's that basically just means, okay, recruit Shigure then and insta promote him with his offspring skill and he's got it. And there you go. Yeah, the way I look at it is like, okay, if you have rally speed, you can forego something like a para bonus for speed and instead focus on bulk, yeah, for example. you can. It's really nice. Yeah, and that, that came up in the discussion about, what was it, Flora in chapter 20? Where like, yeah, you need rally speed for that, for sure. You can't just give 15 speed willy-nilly, but 11, sure. Yeah. All right. Um, all right, should we write on? Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Dwyer, another kid that's never really impressed me. I enjoy the audacity of them giving them a skill that doesn't do anything ever unless you're playing invasions, and that's pretty much it. So, I mean, that skill is, is like, I don't remember how much he gives in combat, I just remember it's like pretty big there, but then everything else he just does nothing. And he's locked to staves early on, so. Not a whole lot of combat going on. I guess easy access to rally res is okay, I guess, but I kind of biased against that because in my last playthrough, I had like six challenges in the end game. This was very easy when you get rally res. It's not really particularly desired. I guess he has a high staff rank, which is something that it's like one of the reasons why Flora and Izana, Flora in particular, are not bought in the barrel because it's kind of rare for you to have a high staff rank at base. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, we said we wouldn't punish or reward units for how easy or hard their paralogs is, but I, th I think it's at least worth noting just how easy Dwyer's paralog is to complete very quickly. Uh, means you can complete a paralog anytime you want to get the exact Dwyer you want or the exact training that you want out of that chapter, which is convenient. Uh, but I've never really found Dwyer himself super useful. I do like doing his paralog early sometimes to get access to his inventory, like getting Physic or I think the only Festal in the game that you get, which is convenient but again it doesn't really have a whole lot to do with Dwyer as a unit I've never really been able to make his combat good and I feel like he's not in the best position to become a good combat unit I feel like almost every kid starts with a better class suited for that so I don't know I don't really like Dwyer much as a unit but it's it's nice if you need an extra warm body I guess for whatever purpose you're doing but he doesn't seem particularly good to me what do you think uh I think I agree. I also want to head off whoever's going to come in the comments and say, well, you get more than one Festal. No, you don't. You only get the Sun Festal. Uh, but it's not the only rod you get, because you can get Silence and Rescue, <laughs> which are rods, not Festals. Um, yeah, Dwyer is, like, he's a decent utility guy. He's got staff rank. Uh, if you're desperate for someone to use in trap late in the game, you can wait till fairly late and, until he'll auto train up to B rank and staves with, with an offspring seal and use that and get in there and that's good-ish. 
It's about about how I feel about Dwyer. Like he's he's good-ish. Uh, starting in Troubadour is pretty bad. Um, everyone who starts in Troubadour doesn't want to be in Troubadour, really. Um, unless, again, if you wait till super late and Ospring seal up and you just become a strategist or something, that's fine. Um, he doesn't really have the stats to make his Troubadour or strategist combat worth caring about. Um, and not even really his butler combat either. Um, He's got more magic than uh, than Jacob, which is nice, I guess. Uh, but the, there's not that many parents who make him a particularly outstanding magic user. Uh, he does have some interesting possibilities because of skill inheritance from his father. Uh, again, I don't really think J Corin marriage is very good for either of the kids. So Jacob and Corin works out because of what you can do with Jacob, but it doesn't... I don't think there's anything truly spectacular you can pull off with passing down Replicate or Trample or anything like that to Dwyer or Kana. Um, but it is at least a bonus that's worth considering. Like, an early Trample on Dwyer is initially going to be useless until you reclass him, but once you do reclass him, he's got, you know, something going for him. Uh, unfortunately, again, if it's Corrin Marriage, his class set is Troubadour, Cavalier, nor Noble, which sucks. It's maybe three bottom tier classes <laughs> to use in the long run. Um, he does get Percy friendship, so he can escape that eventually, but it's not great. Uh, yeah. Since you brought it up, a real quick tangent though, like the kids have basically their own support pool among themselves, right? They, they support their they parents do. and their, and their yep. fellow kids. A couple of those supports, they can. I think they can support all the opposite gender kids, right? Yes. Yeah. Kind of like the pairing system, except I think it's platonic in the end. And then I feel like that usually works out worse for them because kids, as a rule, just join later than parents. Yeah. Part of the big problem for them is they, in order for them to exist at all, their parents have to get married first. So there's that time delay, however, however long it takes for the parents to get married. And then you're getting a new unit who has no supports with anyone other than their own parents. Which are fast supports for whatever that's worth. So if you just want support bonuses from mom and dad, you, you start you get an instant C for free and then can finish B and A rank in the next three maps if you if you really want that. Uh, but if if you want them supporting, you, they don't get cla extra classes from friendship with their parents, unfortunately. So if you want if you want them to use friendship seals or partner seals, you've got to get them partnered up with other kids. And those other kids have those same problems with the parents have to get married first and you have to do their parallel logs. So there's, I mean, one kid's going to be before the other, but regardless, you're going to have to wait uh, somewhere in that relationship. And there's just a lot more that goes into even getting started on supports between kids than there is between the first gen units in general. So those options exist. I, I think it actually is m fairly viable with, if you're going female corn, you're getting Jacob one. Not necessarily with Corrin Marriage, but just having Jacob won. And then if you're recruiting Dwyer and Percy fairly early, which is relatively easy to do, then they might you know, with exist after chapter 11 or 12 or something, and they might start working on their friendship and getting it done by the mid-game. And that, that can work out for them. It's not... I wouldn't say it's unviable. It's just... You know... It's, it's not as quick and smooth as a lot of the other first gen options so it's it's going to be more awkward in general to get your second generation supports going yeah for sure and then the dwyer paralog in general i guess it's not you could do it at literally any time because all you have to do is kill a boss or you can spend a little bit more time in the chapter itself do you usually just do it early to get the unit early or do you just delay it till whatever to get the xp from the high level enemies I usually delay it uh, because I don't really find that Dwyer adds a lot to my army early on. Um, a lot of times I play Melkorn anyway, so he can't exist till later in the game. Um, but I tend not to use the extra staves you can get from that chapter much, partly because I'm scared of using all my special, like unique healing items that I, I can't replace. <laughs> 
It feels bad. Same, I don't want to use my sun festival because what if I need my sun festival? I mean, he's going to use it for you if you don't watch out. <laughs> yeah, dude, that is a, a very funny wrinkle in that that whole paralogue. Is, it tends to be more the physic than the sun festival, um, in my experience. But, like, yeah, if you don't rush to go either kill the boss or go talk to Dwyer and distract the enemies who are about to attack his knight friends, uh, <laughs> he's going to steal your staff uses from you. <laughs> very sad yeah i've also had him die to promoted enemies before because uh the uh, there's like a pair of spear fighters that the generals can't really handle and they just kill them mm -hmm. because the kids can't promote until they get their spring offspring yeah. seals gotta go fast man uh anyhow yeah so i think dwyer his decent ish utility because he does have staff rank he can't promote and get rally res um he has potential because of the way his father's skills work to get something useful. I think the best candidates for that are actually having Jacob marry Elise or Camilla or Baruka to get Trample as opposed to having Corrin do it um, because then Dwyer will also actually get Wyvern Rider from them, um, which is a big help for him. Um, so you can get Trample and then just go through Wyvern Lord for the rest of the game or something like that. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah, you avoid the problem we talked about with Camilla and Baruka. Yeah. Um, and... I, I do also like Azura marriage in, in this case. Um, that's going to take more focus than like Azura and Silas together, because Silas with, with Shelter has a lot of opportunities to get sung to by Azura. With with Jacob, you're going to be like, okay, he's going to do some support thing. Um, I guess if you make him a paladin or great knight, then the same thing applies to him. Um, but if you don't, well, he's going to be Butler Jacob probably potentially strategist and you're going to use Azura to refresh him so he can do more support stuff and you just have to that's totally fine it makes sense in a lot of cases you just have to try um, but I, I do like uh, Azura as a mother for him as well um, because then he can go Falcon Knight and get rally speed and, and keep his staff rank so he gets extra rally and retains staff utility and gets flight and could, could potentially have shelter along the way he can go into Cavalier first Oh, that's nice. So, I guess, like, it's like a, a bit of a distinction from Shigure, at least. Yeah, he'll have... Look, I mean, Dwyer won't have the same rally set exactly. He can still also get rally defense from Percy Friendship, so he could get the same proper rallies, but he won't have the rally HP effect. Um, but he does have more staff rank and yeah. shelter access and stuff like that, so that's cool. Um, I do think he is notably worse than... Shigure, absolutely. Um, for most purposes, though, um, I would call him like lower end of B, around the neighborhood of of Keaton and Charlotte. Like they're very different in terms of what they do, but I, that's about level of utility I think I see in him. Yeah, that's fair. I was expecting him to end up a C tier somewhere, but I do think he's notably better than Kana at the very least, because he has like a couple more options. Yeah, like his, his combat is not terrible. Uh, you said the neighborhood of Keaton and Charlotte. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. He seems worse to me. Again, I'm not okay. not a really big fan I'm... of the, the tubular class in general. Yeah. I'm not going to argue with you. Okay. <laughs> That's not why I'm here. I need to fix my <laughs> overlay real quick. Because uh, Fuka's bald head is on it right now. There you go. It's always so annoying we have uh, two layers of <laughs> two rows of units sit here and they end up going into one row. Uh-huh. <clears throat> Okay, we're about an hour in. I think we do like one or two more kids and then we'll save the rest for next time. Yeah, I think we could get through Sophie and Midori and then get to the Conquest kids next time. Oh, that's a good idea. I like that split. So Sophie's one I'm really excited for because this is a unit that that does really have likable combat to me. Uh, the fact that she appears in every route is very funny to me. I just always end up playing the Sophie Paralog, it feels like, because Silas is so good. And every time I just... I'm not even planning to use Sophie. I'll just deploy her, and then she'll just one round things. And I'm like, damn, this is good. And I don't exactly know for sure why it is, but I can certainly make a guess. I'm guessing that Silas's skill set is just really nice to inherit. Like, I mean, inherit. She she's also a cavalier slash paladin, so she also just gets those skills on her own. But shelter and elbow room are just disgustingly good, and I guess defender is really nice as well. And she just always seems to have a good stat spread for me. I don't even remember what pairings I made in general to make Sophie happen. I just know it works out every time. I've seen her being good as a wyvern rider as well. Uh, but even just as a base class, it just seems very solid to me. And it feels like a unit I could throw into like any other 
reasonably competent class like Ninja and be very good. So uh, she's, she just seems like a really good unit to me that you get for basically free because Silas is already so good. So is that is that just me or is she just that good? I wish she had easy access to Ninja. Oh, That'd no. be awesome. Oh, right. She doesn't. Frick. No. Yeah, for us, she wouldn't inherit. She's not going to be friends with Kaze. Yeah. And there are no ninjas in the second generation. No, rip. Very sad. So Coronel. Not man. even in, uh, well, I guess in, in Birthright, she could marry Asugi. But um, yeah, it's not it's not just there for her for free, sadly. Uh, but Sophie, I think of as being like, basically, what if you took Perry? and just solved most of her problems. Because uh, they actually, in practice, join around the same time, actually, if you're getting Silas married to someone else who joins early. Like, if you're um, if you're pairing him with Azura or, or Effie. Or maybe she's a little bit later if you go for something like uh, Silas and Camilla together, which I really like. Uh, but what Sophie brings to the table is a similar sort of offensive leaning stat spread she's faster than her father um generally not quite as strong but close ish um doesn't have nearly as good a personal skill but um she does get to inherit stats potentially from her parents um and importantly she gets an extra class set uh, and skill inheritance from her parents um so the big thing she has over someone like perry is well number one uh, her secondary class actually does something for her with a mercenary. It gives her the option of all, of going to Bow Knight, uh, which is respectable. Like, it's not going to be a premium combat class relative to, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like a sure situation where, like, she might have slightly better stats than other people, but there are cheaper ways to get into Bow Knight that are just as good for most of the things you want them for, but it's, it exists as an option um, instantly, would and it doesn't for Perry, so Perry's really struggling to find some decent class to go to ever, and uh, every Sophie at least has Bow Knight to go to at some point. Uh, but you can also get Falcon Knight, Kenshi Knight, even Archer Kenshi Knight from, from Mozu, which is cool. Uh, she can get Wyvern from Camilla or Baruka. Those are fantastic. Um, because she doesn't get easy access to Ninja, and she doesn't have a ton of bulk. She's not that good at physical one-two range combat. Uh, you could theoretically get her like Troubadour instead, but then you're going with Felicia parentage or marrying Dwyer or uh, Dwyer or Forest, which is not. I mean, Dwyer is the better option there, but neither of them are that great for her out of the box. Um. So she's not going to be anywhere near where, where her father gets, in, usually, but she she could become a very very respectable just physical combat unit who has access to like good finishing classes, has a number of different ways to get it, to get flight. Um, can even get it from some Selena actually, uh, so she can get um, Kenshi Knight through Mozu, Sky Knight or Kenshi Knight through either Azura or Selena or Wyvern Rider through Camilla or uh, Baruka. It's five different mothers who can give her some form of flight. And they're all pretty good choices. Uh, she's one of the like 80% of the kids who would really, really, really love to have Camilla as a mom. And I think actually makes a pretty good case for it because Camilla and her father work together really well. And she does great with uh, Wyvern access. In fact, one of the one of the big motivations for me doing the train everyone challenge in the first place was way back a long time ago, I did a calculation because I was curious, could you one shot the Stoneborn in chapter 21, the endless stairway with a blessed lance? And I figured out that if you, if you get Camilla Sophie and you pass down trample and like get her into Wyvern with strength plus two and elbow room and defender and trample and the right pair of bonuses and a forged blessed lance, she can do it. A Forge Bliss um, Lance. Yeah, oh, just no. an unusual choice, but you get one free one, and the second one costs you like 3,000 gold. So, you know, it's not that big a cost. Um, it, it's really cool. Um, spoilers, it's not going to happen in the run, because I ended up going in a different direction. 
but it was like one of those thought experience where, experiments where I was like, I wonder if you could pull this off and who would be a good unit at doing it? And I was like, wow, Sophie's very attractive as a choice here. She can fly, she has lance rank, she can get great skills, she has pretty good offensive stats. You know, it's just... It's a really high benchmark to hit. Like, I've only seen, oh, yeah. seen it happen with magical units. Yeah. Um, physical one-shots on those Stone Warner, no joke. Uh, but yeah, she could do it. Um, it's not really something I care about if I'm just like raiding a unit for general purposes, but I think it's cool. I guess it shows just how strong she can be. Uh, without, yeah. Like, I guess she went out of your way fairly far, but the fact that she can reach the benchmark at all says a lot about her potential like attack power, at least. Yeah, and I, I think that still required like an energy drop as well or something. Um, and of course, rallies and tonics and pair up and everything. I but mean, it, you get an energy drop from a paralog, don't you? Yeah, you do. Um, and it's, it's. Uh, I don't actually do think you? that counts, but you know, yeah. people bring it up all the time when I talk about some different units. So I thought I'd, you know, get my revenge here. Yeah, is that? Now I'm doubting that. It is okay. That's that's correct. Yeah, there's an energy drop from the villagers. I think you have to save all of no. Do you have to save all of the villagers to get the energy drop, though? I want to say there's like a reward above it. I vaguely remember someone saying that in chat, but I just remember that like I've been able to get the energy drop multiple times. So at least it's okay. not so hard. There's a, that like... there's a partner seal and an energy drop, and I don't remember what the thresholds are for either of them. Uh huh. Um, because I just save all the villagers every time, duh. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so that's a really cool, like, high end thing that Baruch, that Baruka, that uh, that Sophie can do. Uh, I think it's sort of an unrealistic expectation but I, I think it does illustrate like you said like a, a pretty cool um, like feature that she can strive towards mm -hmm. it's a high uh, ceiling but her minimum is pretty high too like she yeah has like three, at, like at the very least five good moms like, yeah and it it would be a different story if she didn't have that third like if she joined late like let's say her father joined at the same time as xander and you were expecting to recruit her at like chapter 20 plus, and she didn't have uh, a good third class to go to outside of Cavalier or Mercenary, I'd say she's pretty bad at that point. Um, but she's helped hugely by the fact that she joins really early for a kid because her father joins in the first chapter, of the first real chapter of the route. Uh, and he has good partners to work with very quickly. So it's not like he's asked to wait around for some decent wife to come along. Like the latest one that I think he'd really care about is Camilla, and even that can start in chapter ten, so it just works out. Uh, so I, I think Sophie is like she manages to stand out for combat purposes among the kids, which is a pretty impressive thing to do. I don't think a lot of the kids really do stand out compared to the rest of the cast. She's still a lot worse than her dad and her mom, if her mom is Camilla, unfortunately, but she can take up. Uh, some pretty significant combat roles and, and do really well at them. So, where I would put that is still like... Oh, Effie's... I didn't mention Effie. Effie's a decent mom, too. Um, doesn't give her good classes to work with because it's just night, but it's... Like, just strong. Does give her, it, she does give her the option of promoting to Great Knight and getting the, the, gener or the, the night skills for free, which is cool. Oh, yeah, because she already has the class. She just wants the skills. Yeah, fair enough. Yep. Uh, uh, wait, what are so we that, for that? Luna? Uh, well, you get Luna either way, oh, but she would, pick up, she would pick up Defense Plus 2 and Natural Guard. Yeah. Which are both pretty useful. Uh, yeah, those are nice. I, I would put her ahead of Effie, at least. I still think you don't get as much out of her. Cause, like, she's like a reasonably good combat unit but I don't think she's touching what, what you get in the A tier and I think the kind of utility you get out of the likes of Shigure, Gunter, Arthur and even really Baruka and Laszlo is typically more important than what Sophie brings to the table I'm afraid you're right I was, I was kind of wanting her to end up in A tier but I feel like B tier is more appropriate and uh as good as common utility is, it's kind of hard for me to like put her ahead of, say, Shigure even. Uh, so you said like Laszlo ish? What was that? Uh, yeah, I would slot her in behind Laszlo. Yeah, that's fair with me. All right, their symmetry's been totally ruined. I'm sorry. I know. 
Ripperino. Oh well, good tearing for her. I like her a lot. I'm gonna try to make her really good next time I play if I'm going with kids. I think actually... Oh, I have a birthright Soyo where I can use her probably. <laughs> I guess I can do that. Okay. Um, irrelevance. Uh, Midori was up last, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, Dory, Kaze's kid, I like her reasonably. I only used her for Profiteer basically last playthrough I did, but I didn't use that a lot, so it really made me enjoy uh, her because her personal skill boosts the chance. I think it's uh, like a luck percent boost or something like that. I forgot exactly how it works, but it was really big. Do you remember what it was? It's plus 20%, 20 percentage points to the activation rate of any skills that activate based on the luck. Oh, yeah. So, like, if you have 24 luck or so, and you have Midori, then she has 44% chance to activate instead of 24. Broken unit. Gotta get some extra golds. Um, obviously, you can do much more with Miracle her. Miracle Midori strats. <laughs> uh, I feel like Midori can do a lot of unique things, depending on what you uh, what you do with her. Uh, I know a lot of people like Potent Potion, because you can get, uh -huh. like, uh, more use out of tonics that way. Or was it the other one? Uh, salve something? Quick salve. Quick salve. Yeah. Those are Potent funny. Potion, I think, is is cool, but maybe slightly overrated, because it's yeah. not like plus one stats. It It's, at best, it's plus one to every stat other than H... Well, I guess, including HP, it's plus two. But, and for, for luck, it's also plus two. Um, but let's, for simplicity's sake, let's say it's basically plus one across the board. Uh, that's nice but it's not free like to get that you have to pay for tonics mm -hmm. and it, it it's okay it's a modest bonus yeah there are a lot of other skills that are more impactful it, it depends too like how midori stats stack up compared to others because if you're still worse than others you know yeah even with the plus ones and it doesn't really matter it's like harmful yeah, bonuses spoiler. Really. Her, her stats are worse than most others i was kind of expecting that i i just kind of associated her with mozu because she has a similar class and I really like the way Mozu turned uh, yeah. out in late game but I don't know if it really works out for her the way it does for Mozu considering the way we're, we're going about this uh, but I've, I've seen a lot of people hype Midori as like a combat unit and I can kind of see it uh, but I also know there's some dread on her way because apparently she's not as good but I've never really used her as a long-term combat unit I usually recruit her fairly late into the game just when the enemies start getting a lot better and so Midori looks even worse to me by comparison I just end up shoving her into utility roles like Profiteer, and that's about it. But I don't know, I've seen some people do funny things with her, so I'm curious how based those are in the reality that we are, you know, tiering units in. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's start with the problems first, I guess. Um, Midori pulled an Odin, and she put a ton of her growth into skill and luck, and really sandbagged her speed, especially compared to her father. Uh, and that's a big problem for her, because... Uh, he already starts in a fairly slow class, and she does have, like, she's, she's going to have problems doubling stuff. Um, everyone can be fixed, and she's nowhere near, like, Benny level. Like, it's not that hard to make it happen, but it, it does mean you're just going to have to dedicate more speed support to her if you want her to be consistently doubling. So I better start dancing. <laughs> yeah, and that, and that takes away some other stuff that other people can use, too. Um, or it makes her use, you know, pair up partners that are more focused on speed than strength potentially. Although this game does offer berserkers who can cover both. Um, or I guess there's Valoria as well. Um, you know, Wolf Sudden pair up. But uh, yeah, so, so she struggles with speed. She's also not that strong. Um, like it, you did focus a lot on skill and luck and it's just she's, she's accurate that's that's like the best thing about her um but i every time i try to make her like a serious combat unit i i usually notice very clearly that i'm struggling with the the, the concrete offensive stats and she needs a lot of assistance with that and frankly if i'm looking for a like a, a bow unit I don't necessarily want them to be paired up all the time. I'd rather have more flexibility with what we're doing on player phase and dual striking off people and stuff like that. And it's just, just hard to make Midori effective that way. She's a lot worse at the enemy phase kinds of things that bow units can do. 
just because of her low speed. Like the most important enemy phase function that a bow unit has is killing ninjas on enemy phase. And that's something that number one only comes up in a like in a few limited situations that often Midori doesn't exist for. Like you can get her, you can recruit her before chapter 17, but it's you know, you, you have to try because Kaze doesn't join until chapter 12. Uh, she does get to promote to Mechanist, which makes... Um, and she's the, actually the only unit in the whole game who has overlapping promotions in her native class set. So she's the only unit who can promote without getting any extra supports and start in picking up skills from her other base class. If she goes into Mechanist, she, she receives ninja skills as well. Um, unfortunately, the ninja skills don't matter, except if you really need an extra lock touch unit. But lock touch and poison strike by themselves most of the time don't really do anything for you. So it's it's more of a bit of trivia than it is anything that really meaningfully helps Midori out. She can go into Master Ninja and become a lot faster. Um, unfortunately, that does nothing to help her strength. In fact, it makes it a lot worse. So she still needs help with raw offensive stats and i i wish she was better than she is because i i really really i think she's a total cutie and uh i really enjoy what she can do with her personal skill like being able to farm gold with profiteer is a cool thing and that i i wish it was like a neat bonus on top of being another great on top of being a great unit who can be just justified for other reasons. But I think in practice, if you're using Midori, it's because you want to exploit her money generating abilities more than anything else. And that's, that's fun and it can help you do stuff, but it's not important if you're budgeting in a reasonable way. So if you're not spending your money on frivolous stuff and you're not trying to do what I'm doing in my current run, where I'm changing like a million times. Uh, it doesn't really help you. Yeah, it really helped me because I did not budget. I just kind of bought yeah. things on a whim. And then just, sure. there's like a little bit of a draw at some point in the game where you stop getting gold every two chapters. And it's like, well, I got to survive until I get that big dump in chapter 26 or so. And the, I got like four profiteer units at that point that could help me with that emote and her being one of them. She, she's definitely the best employee in the whole company. So oh, yeah. That was really nice. Very productive. Yeah, very productive. Very great asset, if you will. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that was good. That, that by itself, I don't know if that by itself was like the level of utility that it's like even like Perry sheltering people for two chapters, <laughs> but it was nice. Yeah. Uh, it, it sounds like she's really hard to just, it's pretty hard to justify her even being above C tier, though, from what you're, what you're saying. Yeah. I, I do think that. And she's also, unfortunately, not even that good at the kinds of generic support stuff that other kids do. Like, I, I do think the profiteer bonus does put her on that level of just like what other kids can do with just inheriting like shelter and a rally or mm -hmm. something. But Midori has none of that in her own personal class set. She does get access to lock touch if you go that route, but I, I don't think it's that hard to find one lock touch unit who can handle your unlocking needs. No, especially because Lock Touch doesn't require stats to do, so you could literally just deploy no. base level Kaze if you really had to. And it's also yeah. not that often that you needed Lock Touch unit in the first place after a certain yeah, point. Yeah, it really isn't. And when you do, unless you really care about getting to like all the chests in Chapter 17 very quickly, for example, when they're on opposite sides of the map, like you can just take your one Lock Touch unit and go from one side of the map to the other and go unlock the other chest later. It works. Yeah. So I don't think it's that important, um, but she she doesn't really she doesn't have any any of that stuff natively, so she has to get it from her parents. And her father also doesn't pass down anything very helpful for that, unless you like get shelter from Silas friendship, which I why would you spend the money to do that? So, so like recasting Kaze to calf, <laughs> jeez. Yeah. I, so I, I don't think there's a I don't think she elevates herself above the like replacement level of just kid with support abilities at all she does it in a unique way mm -hmm. um and a way that can be very fun if you're if you're trying to be more frivolous with your spending but um she's not actually very 
special or very good. Mm -hmm. The only like kind of unique utility that I think Midori has is what I mentioned earlier, where if you do recruiter super late and you pass down life and death and trample, which is a thing you can do, uh, then you she can be a ready-made Takumi killer. So it's like the eject button. Like if you've only been using Camilla as a combat unit and like maybe Kaze, and they've been building supports with each other, you can get towards the end of the game and realize, oh, I don't have anyone to kill the final boss. I better get them married and go get life and death on Kaze and then I'll handle it. That's a possibility. <laughs> That's good. Uh, all right, so basically Kana level then. Like, just Profiteer instead of Kana's like yeah. basic utility. Yeah, I don't disagree. I maybe a little bit better, better than Perry, um, but sure. not by much. I'll put it over Perry for the for the cool mech. Uh, what is it? The merchant animation. <laughs> there you go. Oh yeah. Going stumbling yeah, into battle. Yeah, she's got a unique class basically, so that's always fun. Yeah, I like that. Maybe that's why I'm so like. I want to try Mozu Kaze for that reason. Just to, you know, match parents with their kids. That's, that's still somewhere yeah. in there. Mm -hmm. Then you could, uh, instead of promoting to Mechanist for the extra skills, you could promote to Merchant for the extra skills and get Aptitude. Hooray. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Underdog. Boo. Better growth on my kids through a parent's skill. <clears throat> All right, cool. So like you said, now we have, I think all the shared kits. I don't think we did any conquest only kits yet, right? We just did the, the right. shared ones. So that means the next time we can get into the uh, into the unique ones, which I don't know, I, maybe it's a coincidence, but they most of them seem more interesting than some of the ones we've tiered today. I feel like Sophie was the most interesting one by far just because her combat mm -hmm. is so good. Whereas the other ones were like, oh no, I guess you're utility bot, no. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think there, there's a bit more of interest about the Conquest kids. And on average, I think they are better than the Shared Route kids. So look forward to uh, discussing that. Yeah. All right. In that case, we'll see you all next time. Zorn, thank you so much for your expertise and your time. You're very welcome. Looking forward to the next one. See ya.